recording. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Poetry as a Catalyst for Radicalization and Liberation for BIPOC and Marginalized People, a new conversation series to the Department of English at the University of Cincinnati. I'm Felicia Zamora, the host and poet and assistant professor of poetry at the University of Cincinnati, and I'll be leading these conversations as we talk about poetry's role towards social change. And I'm very excited for my guest today. Um, I wanna talk really quickly about the, the impetus for this research and this project. Um, this series searches for a collective exploration of poetry's role in activism and social change, specifically from contemporary poets whose art is directly reflecting such inquiries. Joining us today is my guest and poet, Jennifer S. Chang. Jennifer, I am so excited that you're here. I wanna do a brief introduction of you before we begin our conversation. So Jennifer S. Chang's work includes poetry, lyric essay, and image text forms exploring immigrant home building, shadow poetics, and feminine monstrous. Her book, Moon, Letters, Maps, Poems, was selected by Banu Kapil, for the Tarpaulin Sky Award and named a Publishers Weekly Best Book of 2018, alongside Forrest Gander, Ada Limon, Julie Carr, and Raquel Salas Rivera. She is also the author of House A, selected by Claudia Rankin for the Omnidon Poetry Prize, an invocation, an essay, an image text chapbook published by New Michigan Press. She's a 2019 National Endowment for the Arts Fellow and was, has received awards and fellowships from Brown University, the University of Iowa, San Francisco State University, the US Fulbright Program, Kundaman, Breadloaf, and the Academy of American Poets. Occasionally she teaches creative writing, most recently in the MFA program at the University of San Francisco, and as a distinguished visiting lecturer at the Helen Zell Writers Program at the University of Michigan. Having grown up in mainly in Texas and Hong Kong, she lives in San Francisco. Jennifer, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be in conversation with you. Well, before we start talking about sort of poetry's role and social change and what that means to contemporary poets, um, specifically for you, um, how are you? How have you been doing this past year in the pandemic? Um, that's such a big question already. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think like, as for so many people, it's been a prolonged period of just various, you know, shapes and sizes of upheaval and grief and unveiling. Um, you know, I mentioned to you earlier that it's it's come at the tail end of my postpartum year, which I think has really woven and overlapped with the experience in kind of meaningful and significant and interesting ways. Um, yeah, it's it's been a hard it's been a hard year, I think, for everyone, and it's sort of brought to the surface, you know, so many of the the things that have just been underneath bubbling. Oh, absolutely. And actually that that bringing to surface is um, a conversation I've had with multiple friends, both yeah. and not about sort of exposing the seams of our yeah. existence. Um, time has definitely been a huge consideration for people of how are we spending our time and why why do we as specifically Americans believe that we have to fill every moment in time with something that right. is productive, productive right. and, and how that's really hurting us. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's for sure, like revealed all of the, you know, the cracks in um, how, you know, the, the ethos of capitalism has seeped into all aspects of our lives in really detrimental ways. Um, I also think it's, it's really interesting that you know, there in the early in the early weeks after it started, you know, with all of the anxiety and the 
um, uncertainty and fear, um, a lot of people I noticed started gardening, which I thought was so interesting because it's, it's such a bodily and slow process that one engages in. Um, and for myself too, you know, I had this, I had this, uh, like miniature seed kit that someone had given me and it was sitting on my counter for I think months um, and in those early weeks I just you know at one moment I just felt compelled to you know take the seed packet and plant it you know make a little hole in the soil and put the seed in and tend to it and water it and I think there was something really significant about that that like primal um, instinct to, to tend to something, to grow something, to, to engage in something slow and, and mysterious. Gosh, I love that. The tending. I think so often we're, we're so hurried that we forget to tend. I mean, to our own yeah. body, our thoughts are so many things, but then, but then that tending at times when we're rushing and rushing feels like just another thing to do when being natural beings in a natural world, does slow us down to a pace where we don't understand. And I think that in that not understanding, things get really revealed to us again. I, I feel that I feel that that's happened in the, this pandemic for me is that I feel that I'm relearning a few things about myself and about the way that yeah. I'm moving in the world. Um, I, I, I'm sorry to start with such a heavy, <laughs> heavy question. <laughs> around the I'm pandemic because, because it's not like we're post pandemic we're we're still right it's still happening yeah. um and and i think i think for me the what will happen to us um you know in in our mental health in our structures in the way that we do or do not want to continue the way that we have done things in the past it's both um kind of an exhausting time but also perhaps maybe even a hopeful time that that real change can come from all this exposing of the seams. Yeah. yeah, there's been a really strange way, I think, that that contradiction has been um, like almost uneasy to acknowledge, but you're absolutely right that there's been a, 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 you know, a way in which that the breaking and the grief has come simultaneously with mm. some sort of, um, hope and desire uh, for something different, for, for, you know, something better. Um, yeah, it makes me think of, I've been thinking a lot about that, the, the thin fluid edge between decreation and creation, um, you know, just along with the gardening thing, you know, the idea that there is this, this cycle, this season of fallowness, and we're where things must die in order for there to be something new, you know, that every, every beginning, right, begins with a burial of something. Um, I think there's, there's something really interesting and, and uh, important about that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think that this is, this is actually a really great segue, this idea of a hope for something better. And I think largely the pandemic has shook us as humanity because it's included everyone. Because yeah. it's, you know, there, there are certain traumas that BIPOC or trans queer or individuals with disabilities that, that have been going through in this country in various ways throughout, throughout this country's history. The pandemic has sort of rocked the foundation for everyone in very different ways, in very varying ways, right? Um, but I think that it has given us a place where maybe there's the cracks allow us to sort of come through a little bit more um, to feel that real change might be might be possible. So this actually then leads us to the purpose of this conversation is really to, to think about how, how are you seeing poetry's role as an art form in this idea and movement of social change that's happening right now. Um, can you speak to your thoughts around poetry as activism? Do you think of it as activism? Is it activism? Um, is it not? Um, and how do you see poetry in relation 
to these ideations of activism and social change? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, maybe I'll just start trying to articulate in very general terms first. Um, I do think that that this, you know, this pandemic period has made me think a lot more concretely and closely at the about the relationship between poetry and social activism and poetry as social activism and social activism as a poetic, you know, uh, engagement. Um, and I've been thinking about it in relation to that, you know, the thing that I was talking about in terms of attention and tenderness and tending, you know, attending to things. Um, you know, I think that at a very basic level, poetry is about paying attention um, and attending. And there's, I think there's a strange way in which, you know, noticing the small things in the world around us um, in some ways reminds us of how we are also small. Mm. And, and I, you know, this goes into the whole, how motherhood has been uh, influencing my thinking. But as a mother, I've noticed that there's been this tremendous sense of vulnerability that I've never experienced before. And with that vulnerability has come this tremendous um, tenderness and this tremendous uh, compulsion to, to care for, you know, not only my child, but other people and, you know, the world really, um, the earth and all <clears throat> in all its different layers and aspects. Um, I've also, I mean, I've also been thinking about, you know, something that's been so important to me during this period is um, bewilderment. Wow. You know, Fanny Howe's conception of bewilderment as not only a poetics, but an ethics. Mm -hmm. And I think about that so much with, um, with just, you know, even when I teach students, it's it's like this is this is the way that the personal and the poetical and the political are inextricable from one another, right? Because, you know, this this um you know ethos of of uncertainty and mystery and you know as as Fanny House says, weakness, fluidity, concealment, solitude, um, those stand you know in opposition to you know, narratives and ideas of conquest and fame and, you know, power. Um, yeah, and I've been, I've been thinking about it in relation to, um, I've been reading a lot of Edouard Glissant's work. Um, yes. <laughs> that's been so important to my thinking through this period. You know, he has that, that, that idea of trembling knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. Knowledge that that is bewildered, essentially, that, that is not fixed, right? And that is not um, imperial or capitalistic or, you know, inherent with power structures. Um, I feel like that's, it's just, you know, very much, again, bewilderment as a poetics and an ethics, a way of entering the day, a way of living one's life. Right. Yeah. Because if we're, if we're willing to wonder, if we're willing to admit that we don't have anything figured out. I think yeah. that becomes these moments of understanding that we are always vulnerable and it's almost yes. embracing that vulnerability. And it sounds like motherhood is, a is, is actually having you do that even more than you'd ever really thought about it. Because I would say your work, your art is very vulnerable. Um, right. I mean, that's been the only, I feel like art has been the only space in my life. And I almost sort of like cordoned it off into this, oh, this is the space where I get to be, you know, free and vulnerable and to navigate the world in the ways that feel most natural to me. But in other, every other aspect of my life, it's, I've not been able to do that. Hmm. And I do think that motherhood for sure has been drawing that out and, you know, making me question, you know, what does it mean to take that poetic approach um, into all aspects of, you know, how I enter the, the world in the day. Yeah, that yeah. I remember there was one point in time where I really recognized this was early on in my journey of poetry. So it was, it was in it was in my 20s for me because because 
undergrad was a big revelation and um, I had been very closed off and siloed in, in my childhood for, for various reasons. And really realizing that I wanted a poetical existence, that I didn't yeah. just want to write poetry. I wanted the existence that goes along with it. And when you're, right. you're saying this, you know, poetry and this idea that bewilderment is an ethics. It's so funny you brought up Glissant because I've also been sort of turning to, <laughs> to his work at this point in time. I've, I'm still discovering so many um, mm -hmm. writers that, that are really meaningful to me. Um, but I love that, the idea of vulnerability, of bewilderment, of bewilderment and we are also small. That right there for me is also hitting a really deep chord because I, I feel that in our grandiose nature of consumption and bulldozing our way as a species yes. through nature and each other in society and our very dilapidated white supremacy systems, um, we forget how small we are. Yeah. But when we remind ourselves all of our smallness, for some reason, I feel so comforted in that smallness. Yeah. Very, very strange. I think that's another one of those strange contradictions, you know, the way in which that, you know, that feeling of smallness is, is so frightening. It's terror, it's terrifying, but it's also so like it swells. It's a largeness. That feeling is a largeness in itself. You know, I think that's, I mean, that's really what the sublime is to me, right? Is, is that, that contradiction of smallness and largeness and how they meet each other. <laughs> and also that the contradiction of horror and beauty are not opposites. So sometimes they're, they're one in the same and we, in our humanity, we can't, we can't sort of dictate which one surfaces, but we are never without both happening simultaneously, both in the body and outside of the body, I think. And yeah. the more we become comfortable in, in these, these, these really unpredictable things about our humanity, I think the more we become open, we, we become open to others and to embracing all that which makes us unique and special and, um, individual in so many ways. I think this is a, another good, a good movement into the next question. Um, I, I was mentioning this before, I'm a huge fan of House A. Um, it, it's a transformative book for me. I really celebrate and admire how history intertwines with the present in this book. That the hist history is never fully forgotten, but, but also formulating us at, in our identities. It's present in the diaspora of individuals in very palpable and bodily and also like constructive thinking ways. Um, because we, we are as individuals sort of always searching, we're, we're sort of always and forever longing. And your dear mal poems are haunting and yet fiercely demonstrating a craving of existence out of the estrangement of what the, these ideas of home how, how we embody home, how we long for home, how we come from home, how we are home, how we find home. So how do you see social change manifesting in your art and also your own creation processes? Yeah. Um, you know, that space of art and the artistic process, I think, has always been, you know, as I mentioned earlier, a space for me that was free of, you know, all of the other the oppressive structures of the world. Um, it gave me a space where I could process the world and interact with it and engage with it in a way that felt truthful and natural to me, regardless of how the rest of you know, society tells me how to, how sense-making or meaning-making happens. Um, you know, I could, I could do my own sense-making and my own meaning-making in this space. Um, and I think that that speaks to, you know, how, um, you know, in terms of like form and genre, as you mentioned, right? And uh, writing in a language that, that's, that's mine, that feels most interior, 
um, to me, which happens to be this language of holes and of gaps and of ghosts. Um, but I think it's also true in relation to, um, you know, just the conceptions of identity making and, and interiority that, that comes through in the work itself. Um, so, you know, as you mentioned with House A, I think that I was really, you know, at the heart of, of the book is this, this inquiry about, um, you know, this very intimate notion of home building and what that means to, to my body and to me um, and how that comes in a very complex web of, um, you know, of various histories, right? my history, my family history, um, history with a capital H and how that gets so woven in with, you know, all these other notions of, of protection and vigilance and migration and shelter and, and tenderness and love, um, you know, into this, you know, it's all sort of inscribed into the home. And I was very curious about, you know, how does, you know, how is it that this, this presence this very ghostly presence of history, you know, um, permeates the home, not in any, necessarily in any, you know, boundaried concrete, you know, here's an object of history, but, but in very like fluid, ephemeral, per, per, permeating, pervasive ways. Um, I think being able to to name that in a way that I could name it, which is in itself like a, an unnaming, um, is, has, I mean, is just, has been really important, you know, to rename dislocation as location or to, mm -hmm. to almost articulate that as a longing, the longing to rename dislocation as location, um, you know, to imagine and and attempt to to name or acknowledge the inability to name, you know what what this home really is. Yeah. Um, I think that that's been, I mean, just so fundamental to my own sense of self. Um, and I think that, you know, I don't know if this is exactly what you were asking with that question, but. As I've grown older and as I've sort of, you know, been engaging in that, you know, the, the act of trying to decolonize various aspects of my life, I find that um, it's only making that space of art and, and writing more confident and um, freer. You know, there's a way in which I'm, that, that, you know, this process of decolonizing um, is making smaller that other voice, you know, that other voice that's always assuming that someone else is, is an authority, um, that my voice has no authority. And I think that that's also a way in which, you know, art making and social activism really go hand in hand together. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, and especially, and I think about being educators, how more and more we're seeing students wanting and craving and also taking um, so social change and creative writing classes. Like they want yeah. to feel that they can make a difference sort of in all aspects of their existence. And for me, it took so long to figure that out. <laughs> I mean, the, the power of the confidence and power that art begins to give the artist. You know, it's this process of, we think we're creators, but we're actually being created simultaneously when we're in the art making process. And I think all of these things that you're bringing up is like dislocation as location, so many, um, Know, individuals who come from immigrant histories, individuals who come from language where English has been somewhat violent to us and is violent to us, not even somewhat, where physical violence has come into our existence. Like this idea that we have been completely disheveled and because of X, Y, Z, but we bring back and create our own homeness create this idea of, of naming it and saying it. And, and isn't that activism? Like, isn't that the impetus for changing perspectives? What if the perspective is also our own? Um, yeah. 
and, and what is, and what does that mean for us as 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 citizens of of of, of the world as, as artists and citizens of this this world making which we do inside of our art yeah i mean it makes me think of i mean a couple things one um is just how you know as you said like i think the world as we came into it you know was in this place where we where everyone was sort of putting everything into compartments right even i mean i just think about even the whole the whole um significance of ethnic studies being you know a a, a category a category, a department that's cordoned off and then acknowledged and then put away, um, you know, which is, I mean, it's important for it to exist, but also everything, you know, the boundaries as in the boundaries of genre are, are just, they're artifices, right? Somebody created them, they're constructs, and they're useful for, you know, thinking and talking about, about the various, you know, fields and disciplines, genres, forms, but but ultimately we always have to remember that they don't exist, that they're arbitrary, that somebody decided, um, you know, where those boundaries were and that in actuality they're fluid and they're moving. Um, I also was just thinking about how I, I don't think I realized this when I was writing it, but in my, my second book, Moon, I think in some ways that book is very much about the, like a journey of the artist in making. And it's because it's so much about you know, how does one rebuild from, from devastation, whether it's, you know, the world's devastation or a devastation of one's own making, you know, a decreation of one's own making. Um, and how does one make a home, a nest um, that's in the shape of one's body? Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, there's just so much I realize now in that, in that project that was about, um, making making uh, again this idea of making a home with one's with one's body for one's body in the shape of one's body and i i do think that you know social activism social change um has to begin with that question for the self yeah. um, before it can become a question for everyone too if that makes but sense i've been beginning to think of this more as like the entanglement of wonder and how no matter what we're researching, our wonder is never outside of ourselves because it's never outside of our thinking. It's never right. out of our synapses that are taking place in our brains. Like it, it is always bodily. Um, and, and we can't get we, we can't get around that, nor should we want to get around that. But this idea of, of you talking about a nest in the shape of one's body, you know, what is a nest? A nest is a gathering of what's around, of what one sees, of what one understands, of what one feels and, and feels can help represent that form. And I love that, especially, you know, from the idea of, of being a poet of color, um, of being someone who, who is writing about experiences in this country that are you know, absolutely unique as you as Jennifer S. Chang, but also unique as, as you in the cultures and the identities that you also resonate with. Um, because that nest is also outside and inside the body simultaneously um, with the things that we gather close to us, right? And that, and that's showing, I think that goes back to the confidence uh, and I don't know, I don't know if it's as we get older, because I sort of feel the same thing to, to say what needs to be said now, um, which actually moves into the next question really well, which is what, what does it mean for you to be a poet in the current climate of this nation? Um, mm. Does the poet have any obligations in contemporary poetry, if any? And I, and I know that you know, both of us as women of color is there a different type of obligation? Oh, that's interesting, yeah. I mean, I was thinking, you know, when I was sort of reflecting on this question, I was thinking about how, you know, on this very large, right, scope, you know, as humans on this existential level, we're all really after the same thing, which is, you know, we want to matter and we want to be whole. Mm. Um, 
I think that my, you know, my, my obsession about home building is really about that, right? Yeah. Um, how to be safe, how to be whole. But I, I think that, you know, we all go about it in different ways and some more harmful than others, right? Um, and I think as a poet, it feels like, like my, my obligation, um, my vocation is to sort of resist the mechanisms and meanings that have been normalized and centered in ways that are, you know, often detrimental and oppressive, inequitable, but also even just forgetful, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it makes me, I mean, just thinking about what we've been talking about, it makes me think about how that concept of fluidity you know, in connection with whatever is concrete and grounded needs to be there. Um, things need to always be in process. Like there's no truth almost in product, if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, totally, it totally does. <laughs> I mean, I think if anything, the pandemic, I, what I've been focusing so much on is just like process, like how, how that in itself is is sort of what I'm what I'm after and what I think the world really, you know, underneath everything is after. Um, you know, product is a thing that has that has to happen in some ways, but it's it it always has to come with almost like the 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 premacy of of process. Um, anyway, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that you know a poet is here to help us see familiar things as strange, right? You know, we talk so much about how to make things strange and to defamiliarize ourselves with things. But I think it's in service of, of renaming the world in a more healing, equitable and honoring way. And that itself is, a, is an ongoing process, right? Um, I think there's something about the way in which, you know, art and the artistic process has always really felt for me to be akin to prayer, you know, akin to, you know, a kind of longing for something that will never really be answered, but it's in the act of, of asking or in, of invoking that feels, it, that itself feels really important. Um, and it feels sacred to me, you know, the artistic process definitely feels really sacred to me. Um, you know, language, I feel like was always meant to be sacred. And I think, as a poet, it feels like my 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 work is is to honor that in some way. Um, yeah. Well, and I, I love this idea of the sacred, especially in the process, because I have always felt that there is magic in yeah. the process of art making and not this not this metaphorical magic, like a real magic that happens both with with the body and the mind in the page and what comes out because for, for me i love this idea of language being sacred but i also think language fails so often yeah. it, it so often fails us and, and hurts us and wounds us but yet it's what we have and we have to we have to take it back and figure out how to through our working of it through our molding of it through our shaping of it allow it to come back to the sacred back to the magical versus all the other ways that it's being used by, by other individuals throughout the world. Um, and so I love this idea of magic and it also brings me back to what I think is a ne the next level of exploration then is imagination. Because I, I think imagination in poetry is so crucial. I mean, it's so crucial in art period, but how how do you see imagination's role and specifically imagination in the arts play into this invent, invention and radicalization of, of a world where you know we as BIPOCs and other marginalized people can fully feel liberated? I, I think the page allows us to do that in some ways, but how perhaps um, how perhaps is is our imagination really working toward something beyond just one piece of art, like beyond the product you're talking about, right? How is it working beyond that product? 
Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that for me, one of the biggest struggles um, has been even giving myself the permission to imagine, yeah. you know, to even understand what does it even mean to imagine? I think I didn't even know really. And I still, you know, I'm in the process of learning, like, what does that even mean? Um, <laughs> And I think it's because, you know, no one ever asked me, you know, what do you, what do you need? What do you desire in this space? So I never really asked me myself that question. You know, I, I've been thinking how imagination feels like this, this like undiscovered muscle or something or a foreign language, something that you have to practice at first in order to fully wield. Um, and, you know, I was listening to this, uh, this interview um, on the podcast on being with Krista Tippett, she was interviewing Ocean Vuong. And I think somewhere in there, he was talking about, you know, what does it mean to grow up as a brown body surrounded by, you know, images, um, only images of oneself, mm -hmm. sort of in this, in this in this action of disappearance. I don't think he said it exactly like that. I'm, you know, I'm kind of <laughs> summarizing and <laughs> paraphrasing in my own <laughs> thinking, but, but, you know, in what does it mean to grow up and see only see one's body in, in film and in literature, um, you know, in all other ways as not only as, you know, incidental and marginalized, but as like objects on which, upon which violence has been enacted or um, as, you know, bodies that are vanishing or disappearing um, or do not exist. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that that has been such a hurdle for, for me, um, just giving myself, I mean, asking myself that question, you know, what do you desire? What do you, what do you need? Um, it makes me, I mean, uh, one, a poem that has been really helpful for me in these last few months. Um, I don't know if you know Meditations in an Emergency by Cameron Awkward Rich. You should read it. Um, I'll send it to you after this, but. Thank you. It's, it's a poem that I realized, you know, so it articulates this, there's sort of this repetition of, um, you know, these various images in the world. It breaks my heart, it breaks my heart, right? Um, but in that, in that sort of grief and loss, there is an articulation of, of beauty, mm -hmm. um, of seeing beauty, of recognizing beauty in the world. And then somewhere in the poem, there's this turn where it's, you know, the, the speaker is, is wanting to, to articulate this desire to love the world, mm -hmm. um, to push at those boundaries of beauty in the world and expand them and make them better and make them bigger and make them inclusive for oneself. Um, and I think, you know, so much that even the, even the ability to desire, right, which is what imagination is, even the ability to desire something else, um, is it, is, that's what hope is, right? That's like hope incarnate in a way. Um, you know, I can't hope for something if I, if I don't even ask, if I can't, I mean, I can't ask myself that question, right? right. Um, and yeah. What a powerful ideation of this, this idea that, and, and I, it resonates with me so much because when you said, what, it is it, what does it even mean to imagine? I immediately in my mind were scrolling back to me at five years old, trying to think of, I had an imagination, right? Like I, I, I literally just had to ask myself that question because I felt like it was, it was not beaten out of me, not um, taken from me because, right. but something became a conditioning, right? Of, yes. I mean, I, I grew up in a, in a very white area where my sister and brother and I were the first kids of color. I mean, my, my mom is white, so, you know, so I'm biracial, but we were told you're Mexican. Like I was told by so many other people what I was. And I realized that I never lost my imagination. I didn't know exactly what you just said though. Like 
what does it even mean to imagine? It's like I put it away, or it's like I was only allowed to see so far in front of me. Like I was only allowed this far, but I kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And I think that that's what we're doing, right? Like we're realizing that these boundaries are boundaries that other people and other things and systems are trying to put on, on us. And through our imagination, we are breaking it. Yeah. We're pushing through it, but I'm still discovering that too. I, I like, I realize it feels like such an unfair and large question to be asking all of you as, as poets, but I feel it's, it's, it is important for us to really get to identifying what our relationship is to imagination and how that comes into play, because that is a key factor of radicalization. I mean, that's, I think that that's the question I want to be asked, right? That's the, it's the terrifying question that I long to be asked. Um, you know, I was just thinking when you were talking that, you know, there's, there's so much in that Audre Lorde essay when poetry is not a luxury, you know, where she talks about, yes. you know, how poetry is the quality of light upon which we, um, you know, predicate our thoughts, which turn into idea. Um, no, I'm like, <laughs> this is not exactly what she's saying, but it's like where we, where we listen to our bodies, which then tells us, you know, what it is we are actually desiring um, or longing for. And then from there, we're able to turn it into, into thought, into language, into action, into change. Um, and I don't think, you know, I've read that essay so many times over the years. And I feel like every time I return to it, I'm, I'm like learning another layer or understanding another layer more fully. I don't think I ever, you know, it moved me, but I don't think I understood exactly what she meant, you know, when I first read that essay. And I think, you know, I'm slowly, I'm slowly coming to, to, you know, an, an understanding of what, what, what she means. Um, yeah. I, th I think the, I think the discovery goes hand in hand with imagination though. And, right. and when we return to text, we realize that there was still so much to discover because we're on the journey of, 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 constant discovery. I mean, right. I am not the same artist I was six months ago, a week ago. One, one would argue yesterday and one would argue after this conversation, I'm a changed yeah. artist. <laughs> and and I, I love that. Like I will never stop the, the evolution. And I think the more that goes back to that vulnerability and to bewilderment and to wonderment and to the sublime and to imagination of all these things that if we can build worlds that make people think yeah that make people feel that make people wonder how is that not in my opinion working toward a greater existence for all humanity and that's yeah. social change. It, I mean, we don't get to, I don't think we get to see it, right? Like we, we put our art in the world and we don't know how it's going to impact someone. But I think for me, I have to, I have to hope it does. Um, yeah. And, and for my last question then, because I, I was going to ask you what, what you're hopeful in poetry, but I actually think that you started talking about that hopefulness. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think that has to be a focus of of hope in one respect is something that we have to earn. We have to earn it back, but we can also never fully give it up. Like in, in my opinion, hope makes some people stagnant and stagnancy is hurting us. Yeah. That, that's white supremacy. That's the way things have been. That's the hurting and killing of black and brown and trans and queer and, and of individuals throughout time. And that needs to stop. But we also need to make the hopefulness turn into that which is tenderness. That is, that is the smallness for all of us. So, so I guess my last question would be, what are your thoughts around contemporary poetry that you're seeing and reading um, and its movement in the upcoming years? Like, do you think the landscape is transforming? Um, especially in this wake of the, the relentless violence that's taking place 
to Asian American Pacific Islanders, to brown and black bodies, um, to queer and trans people. Like, mm -hmm. is there, is the urgency swelling? Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't think it's a coincidence that that all these acts of violence have been there's been an upsurge of it you know there's been a surge of yeah. of violence um i don't think that it's been, i don't think it's a coincidence that that's been happening alongside as as um there's been you know finally like movies films with um you know, with Asian Americans, um, awards being won. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some people have talked about you know this golden age of, of um, you know, BIPOC poetry. I just, you know, I think that that of course, of course, both of these things have been happening at the same time, um, and I think that that just makes it all that much more urgent, um, and all that much more. in a strange way, like fortifying, right? Mm -hmm. um, like, yes, we are, we are growing. Yes, we are, we are swelling, we are vast. Mm -hmm. um, we are transforming. Um, I mean, I, I also just, you know, going back to that Cameron Awkward Rich poem, I feel like you know, those, those are the poems that are not only helping me to articulate, you know, the connection between, between beauty and, and social change, but also, and I don't know if I can quite articulate this, but there's a way in which that, that the, the transformation that happens in that poem Right, gives me a way of thinking about how the transformation of, say, you know, abolition mm -hmm. may happen. Right, um, that, yeah, you know, that first of all, that that was something I wouldn't have even, have even known to ask for mm -hmm. um, until somebody else said that this is something you can ask for, or what is it that you want to ask for, <laughs> um, and you know, to start there, but even beyond that, you know, that it is this ongoing unfinished process and that's that's the way it's gonna be and that's okay. That's almost like the work itself, right? It's not about finding the product, it's about the process of engaging towards that direction um, and and listening to, listening to what my body, you know, what my deepest intuitions of, of you know, self is asking for. Um, yeah, I don't know if that at all really answers that question, but that's what, what made me think about. No, I it, it does. And this idea that the of courseness, right? The of course these are happening together because we are swelling, because in a hope we are beginning to reach a precipice where white supremacy is going to not be the narrative. Um, and in that, it feels like, I mean, what horrid growing pains, right? Like, I, I, I can't even quite say it that way because I, I feel like the death and the violence, it, you know, it, I want these people back, right? Um, but we are, we're a nation on fire. Um, and for me, if it was just the fire and the violence, and it wasn't all of the hopeful, beautiful things that are also taking place, it would feel, um, unbearable. And at times it does feel unbearable, but I think that's where this, the hopefulness comes in is that, um, things are getting hotter because I believe we're working toward disintegration of. Right, right. 
but it's a journey, right? It's a journey. It's definitely a end. Um, Jennifer, thank you so much for your thoughts and your words and your art and, and sharing this virtual space um, with me and with listeners today. Um, this has been amazing. I, I, I tell you, if we're, we're speaking of transformation and if we're thinking, speaking of hope and if we're speaking of the power of thought and art, this feels like that in which we are working toward. <laughs> I mean, thank you for the space of this conversation um, and just asking me, you know, that question of what I hope for, what I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. And so thank all of you who, who have tuned in to watch. Um, look for future discussions with poets uh, Dr. Joshua Bennett and Vanessa Angelica Villarreal as we continue to explore the art form of poetry as a catalyst for social change and activism. Thank you for watching. Jennifer, thank you so much. Thank you so much.